like I said, it's really an honor to be here today, particularly to talk about a topic that is very near and dear uh, to my heart, prioritizing mental health for people on the autism spectrum. And before we jump in to the main information, I wanted to share the agenda, but what I'll, what I'll be planning to cover during today's presentation. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on uh, co-occurring psychiatric conditions and what we mean when we talk about co-occurring psychiatric conditions for people on the spectrum. Um, spend some more time on um, what are the evidence-based mental health interventions uh, for this population. And then I know we've got a wide variety of stakeholders, key stakeholders here today in the audience. Um, I have some recommendations directly from autistic adults for mental health clinicians. I think these recommendations apply um, more broadly uh, than, than clinicians only as well. Um, so I will share those briefly before wrapping up with some resources. And then I very much look forward to your, your questions and discussion. One other um, piece of information I just wanna highlight here, and I know we've talked a little bit about this already in today's presentations, is just language preferences and how um, I, I recognize and respect that there are, are variable language preferences out there in terms of how we refer to people on the autism spectrum. Um, some people prefer identity first language or um, autistic person. Other people may prefer person first language or person with autism. Um, as you'll hear a little bit more about today, um, I am very fortunate to get to partner with some amazing autistic collaborators in my research. Um, and my partners, my collaborators have expressed identity first language preferences. And so that's the language that you'll be hearing me use today in today's presentation. I have learned a lot as well from this article from the journal Autism and Adulthood. So I just wanted to highlight it here. I know ableism has also come up in some of today's conversations. Um, and I often will refer back to this article um, titled Avoiding Ableist Language Suggestions for Autism Researchers. And there's some nice explanation there around identity first versus person first language. All right, so why, why this topic on mental health? Why, why was I invited to speak on this today? Um, as many of you know, autistic individuals are at disproportionate risk for mental health problems compared to the general population. And these co-occurring mental health problems contribute to functional impairment, to reduced quality of life, and also to an increased risk for suicide in autistic people. Uh, for many autistic individuals and their family members, in fact, these co-occurring psychiatric conditions are a primary source of impairment and a top reason for seeking services. And um, so as a, as a psychologist, I know my colleagues and I, we are oft, often seeing um, individuals on the spectrum for mental health needs, and that is really the, the primary source of impairment and, and what they're seeking help for. Given all of this, it's not surprising that improving autistic individuals' mental health is a top research priority for the autistic community. I think the other reason this topic is really important to talk more about is we know that diagnostic overshadowing happens frequently. Um, for those of you not familiar with this term, diagnostic overshadowing means that symptoms or characteristics of the mental health condition are attributed to the diagnosis of autism and thus are overlooked as a distinct disorder. So for example, I could be seeing someone on the spectrum with some clear cues of anxiety, and I could say, oh, well, that's not anxiety. That's all kind of under this autism umbrella. And the problem with that, right, is we miss the chance to connect that individual with evidence-based therapeutic supports focused on anxiety. So it's very, very important to be able to recognize, um, be able to identify, these behaviors that may respond to specific mental health interventions. So those are the, the main reasons I can think of for focusing on this topic today. I know that there are many more out there. So as I've alluded to, we know that autistic people of all ages are at a higher risk for experiencing co-occurring psychiatric conditions relative to non-autistic people. Um, in fact, many autistic individuals will meet diagnostic criteria for multiple co-occurring psychiatric conditions, so more than one. Um, the five I have listed up here are the ones where we have the most research support to show that autistic individuals are at an increased risk of experiencing these conditions compared to non-autistic people. 
Um, I think that some of the ones not listed up here, we need more research in. For example, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I know that we need more, more research into the experiences of, of autistic people with PTSD. Um, but these five have received the most um, attention and support to show that autistic individuals are experiencing these at increased um, rates. Another um, key point I just want to make here, this is not a, a psychiatric condition, but it is something that is gaining a lot of attention, and rightfully so, um, in the autism community. Um, this is a paper that came from Aspire, um, led by Dr. Dora Raymaker, where um, this team defined autistic burnout. Um, this just came out a couple of years ago, and so um, for many people, this may be a new term, autistic burnout. And um, the team here, the authors here, define autistic burnout as a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic life stress and a mismatch of expectations and abilities without adequate supports. And what it looks like, how you might recognize it, if you're talking or working with an autistic person, is pervasive, long-term, typically more than three months, exhaustion, a loss of function, and reduced tolerance to stimuli. It goes beyond tiredness, right? I know many of us, um, myself included, will talk about just being really tired and you know maybe burned out from um, from whatever we have going on in our in our lives. Um, autistic burnout is different. It goes beyond tiredness. It's also um, different from depression, and that's why I wanted to include a couple of slides about autistic burnout because we're going to be talking in just a few minutes about evidence-based treatments for anxiety and depression. And autistic burnout is distinct from depression. Um, and as a psychologist, I've been thinking about this more and more recently in terms of the effects of the intervention that we're recommending. So I'm just gonna share a few thoughts about this and then we'll really get into those evidence-based mental health interventions. So if we think about someone, let's say coming into a clinic um, and they are experiencing autistic burnout, on the surface, autistic burnout could look a lot like depression, right? They've withdrawn from a lot of their activities. Um, they are feeling really exhausted. There may be some loss of functioning or loss of skills. And so I'm, I'm sure that this happens relatively frequently where someone experiencing autistic burnout is diagnosed with depression. And maybe at first glance, we could think, well, it's not the accurate diagnosis, but at least they're getting some supports um, they're, you know, in, in the clinic, hopefully talking with um, a therapist. So maybe that's not a huge, huge deal to get that misdiagnosis. However, when we think a little bit more about it, the intervention approaches are, are very distinct. Um, so we could talk all day about this. I'm going to keep this short. But for someone experiencing autistic burnout, the recommended approach is to rest, to build capacity, and to reduce masking. If someone is experiencing depression, the evidence-based recommendation is often uh, something called behavioral activation or activity scheduling, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. Behavioral activation looks just like what it sounds like, I think. Get up, activate yourself, get up off the couch, get out of bed, um, get outside, uh, go socialize with people, even if you don't feel like it. Um, go for a walk, get some exercise. And, Hopefully, in hearing that description, you can you can see that behavioral activation for depression would look very different than the recommended approach for autistic burnout. And that leads us to think that implementing behavioral activation with someone in autistic burnout would likely worsen the autistic burnout, which is very concerning. When I've been talking with um, autistic people and um, other clinicians about this recently, I know this question comes up a lot. What about when autistic burnout and depression co-occur, which could definitely happen? Um, the, the recommendation at this point, and of course we need some more research into this, but I think this makes a lot of clinical sense. Um, the recommendation for the individual with both autistic burnout and depression would be to rest until the burnout reduces and then move on to, to depression treatment. Um, so I'm hoping that we can have some more discussion about this at the end of this, this presentation. I'm sure many people here listening to talk um, in more detail about this and, and describe this much better than, than I can. So 
thanks for um, for listening as I kind of threw in that part about autistic burnout, because I, I do think that's really important as we're thinking about co-occurring psychiatric conditions and evidence-based intervention strategies, which we will move into now. So a lot of my training um, has been in cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, tailored for autistic people. And the reason I focused on this so much over the years is that it is uh, the intervention that the mental health intervention that has the most research support behind it for improving anxiety, um, depression, and other co-occurring psychiatric conditions in people on the spectrum. More research is definitely needed, but this, this approach, the CBT approach, has gotten a lot of attention um, in the last 15 years or so. Really started with a focus on CBT for children and teens on the spectrum who have anxiety. And then more recently, um, we're learning more about how CBT is effective for um, autistic adults um, and also for co-occurring depression. Um, I will say that CBT is not um, meant for everyone and we need more research about how to modify CBT for, for certain individuals as well. In many of these studies, um, the participants had a verbal age, meaning their verbal, verbal abilities tracked with about an eight-year-old um, chronological age of eight years old or above. Um, and many of these studies did not include autistic people with co-occurring intellectual disability, which is a major gap in the research, um, although this is changing and some groups are, um, are working on this now. However, for many people on the spectrum, the evidence does support using CBT for conditions such as anxiety or depression. And one part I find really interesting is that the analytical um, style of thinking that many autistic people um, describe could be a particularly good fit with the CBT approach. So for anyone listening who's not familiar with the CBT approach, I wanted to include a few slides about this. CBT is a structured, short-term, and present-oriented therapy. So it's not focused a lot on, on your past, on your childhood. It's really focused on the present. Um, CBT examines an individual's interpretations of situations and focuses on changing or modifying unhelpful thoughts and behaviors. And it's really focused on this idea that thoughts, behaviors, and feelings are all connected. And by changing our thoughts or changing our behaviors, we can feel better. Um, so an example of um, changing our thinking would be if we knew, okay, I'm really catastrophizing this um, situation. I'm having some, some really, really negative thoughts um, about how bad this is going to be. I could spend some time reevaluating the evidence um, that supports that, that thought. And I'll, I'll share an example of that in just a moment. Um, an example of changing behavior I think a lot about uh, facing our fears when we are anxious um, and our natural response may be to avoid what's making us anxious. Um, but if we change our behavior and, and face that, that fear head on, um, that can have a really positive effect um, on improving anxiety um, and improving those anxious thoughts as well. CBT also includes a focus of um, coping strategies to reduce distress. And when um, I have families tell me um, oh, CBT didn't work for me. One of the kind of checks that I'll use to see were they really, were they really receiving CBT from, from the therapist? I'll ask if they had any homework or any assignments in between sessions. Um, if they say, no, we just showed up once a week and talked, that is not true CBT. Um, a CBT program will include some practice outside a session because we know that a real change needs some real practice in the individual's day-to-day uh, -day, uh, setting, not only in a therapist's office. So here's an example that I mentioned. Um, so if a situation is a friend calls to cancel plans at the last minute, a thought may be, she's too busy for me, she doesn't care about me, she hates me. Um, if I am thinking that, that is certainly going to affect my emotions and potentially my behavior as well. So you see these arrows here are bi-directional because they all can kind of feed into each other. If I'm having that thought, I'm likely gonna feel angry, maybe depressed. Um, I may yell at my friend on the phone um, or I may hang up and throw the phone as well. Um, so you see this triangle here and the idea is by really reevaluating the evidence for this thought and thinking of um, something that might be a, a more helpful or less upsetting thought, we can have some significant changes in how we're feeling and, and how we're behaving. 
So some general principles of CBT in case this has um, is not been made clear already, it's really an active treatment or an active intervention. Um, a CBT therapist should have a clear conceptualization of how these thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are linked. Um, it's really focused on skill development, which I've heard from many autistic individuals, they um, really appreciate um, that it's not just sitting there talking about, you know, how are you doing, but they're focused on um, real changes in, in skills that they can implement in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so it's a very practical approach. It's also very collaborative. It's not just the therapist uh, sitting there and, and talking and giving advice for the full hour. Um, it's really a collaborative approach focused on solving current problems. And then again, one of my favorite parts is building on strengths. So taking a strengths-based approach. Um, some, some people in the field will, will talk about something called little c, big B, CBT, um, which I have listed up here. Um, and CBT programs, you know, manuals that you can easily buy, uh, usually start with the focus on changing the thoughts, some more of the cognitive piece, the C piece. However, we know that for some people, it will be easier to start by changing a behavior. Um, so for example, um, with, with the anxiety example I shared earlier, uh, really checking to see if acting brave um, and not anxious makes you feel any different um, versus doing the cognitive restructuring components first. So for some clients or individuals, the therapist may wanna spend less time on those earlier sections um, on addressing some common errors in thinking and really focus to more of the, of the B, the B part. So as I mentioned for anxiety treatment, this is gonna look like a big emphasis on something called exposure, which is basically a fancy word for facing the things that are making us feel anxious. And for depression treatment, this behavioral piece is gonna be a big emphasis on behavioral activation, which I mentioned earlier. So when thinking about implementing CBT for autistic people with co-occurring anxiety or depression, um, there could be some potential challenges um, that, may, that may come up. And I've listed up here on this slide, some of the more, more common um, challenges. And then in keeping these in mind, we'll talk about what are the more common modifications um, for CBT for people on the spectrum. So as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the CBT programs have been designed for people um, with at least an age eight verbal ability. And so for individuals with language and or cognitive difficulties, um, some of the traditional CBT programs may not be a great fit. If an individual has a difficult time recognizing or naming their thoughts and feelings, traditional CBT may be challenging. I know many uh, therapists have shared that um, they're worried about pushing autistic people too much in sessions. So thinking about those exposures with anxiety, um, they're worried about um, emotion regulation difficulties. So maybe having um, um, a meltdown in um, session or, or trigger, triggering some extreme distress. We also know um, that many people um, on the spectrum also will have some difficulties with executive functioning. So planning and organizing and, and um, maybe keeping track of those homework assignments that a CBT therapist um, is assigning. So again, um, the clinicians need to be aware of this to, to build in some supports around this or some accommodations. And then limited family resources and family accommodations so this is really two things in one. I know um, many CBT therapists need to keep in mind that this may not be the only session or only appointment that this family um, is going to in a week. Um, and so just remembering that many individuals on the spectrum and their family members have many other things going on and we need to be really realistic in, in what we are perhaps assigning for homework um, and making sure that we're setting them up for success with these assignments. Um, similarly, family accommodations, um, accommodations, I just used that word a few minutes ago in, in a positive way, right? We wanna really support. Um, I think Lindsay and Dave also talked about accommodations in the um, previous session on, on relationships. So that can be a really positive and good thing. Um, when we're thinking about anxiety um, or even depression, accommodating anxiety or depression can really get in the way of effective mental health treatment. So we wanna be aware of that and, and talk 
talk to the autistic individual or the family about um, both kind of helpful or protective accommodations and potentially unhelpful or excessive accommodations. And then I've heard concerns from clinicians about difficulties with therapeutic alliance. Um, we will talk some more about that and potentially some motivation limitations. Um, and again, some of these modifications that we're about to discuss, I think we'll get, we'll get at this. I think this is honestly a very common um, misconception in the mental health field um, that these, these concerns are, are gonna come to light. Um, but we'll, we'll talk more, talk more about that and happy to, ha happy to have a discussion around that as well. All right, so for this next session, next section, excuse me, um, as I mentioned, I'm gonna go through um, seven common modifications to CBT to better fit the, the learning style of autistic individuals. Um, and although this has really been studied in, in CBT modification, I think many of these are um, helpful modifications or adaptations for other approaches as well. So the first here is to increase the use of visual aids or visual supports. Um, visual aids are a part of traditional CBT. There are always lots of worksheets and handouts, um, but many times we need to really increase the, the frequency or the use of these while also making sure that they're developmentally appropriate for the autistic individual we're working with. So not everyone, for example, is gonna love a bunch of cartoon um, figures or, or cartoon visual aids. So really checking in um, with the autistic individual to see what types of visual supports they find most helpful. Um, I know that our team here has found um, this to be a benefit of telehealth, being able to share screens, um, even sometimes pull up some, some slides that have some visual supports on there. Um, and share our screens to help that structure the session. Um, so these visual aids could include things like checklists, visual schedules, um, or scripts. A really important um, thing to keep in mind is using really direct um, language, concise language. This is something that I continue to work on, um, particularly when I'm collaborating with, with my wonderful autistic uh, collaborators on my research projects. I think I have the tendency to use too many words and um, that, can, that can be problematic. And so really trying to cut down to what really needs to be said, keeping it direct um, and keeping it concise. Some of the CBT programs have a lot of metaphors built in, a lot of analogies. That may not be the best fit if you're working with someone with a really concrete um, thinking style. So it's a good thing to check in about. Another common modification is to extend the time period. So a lot of these CBT programs are a 12 session approach, um, about 45 minutes to an hour session. Um, and what the research has shown us is that when working with autistic individuals, it's often helpful to extend that time period. So we may not cover the exact same amount um, in one session, and hopefully the therapist has some flexibility to, to be okay with that. I know sometimes there are, there are some restraints, um, constraints around billing um, and clinic schedules, but um, the, the less that we can rush this and really spend time to make sure that um, we are giving the autistic individual time to really um, process, um, not rush them for, for their responses, um, taking some breaks, um, and then also potentially having some, some additional practices for facing, um, facing those fears to help with the generalization. Incorporation of focused interests or passions. Um, this is something that, again, I feel like I've heard clinicians kind of shy away from this, that they're nervous to bring up um, an area of strong interest or passion because they don't want to derail the session. They don't want the autistic individual to um, kind of get stuck on that topic. And where I do understand where that concern is coming from, but I, I think that this can be used by clinicians um, in, in a really thoughtful way. And it's a really fun way to, to learn about new things. I've learned um, so many um, different things from working with autistic individuals and really engaging with them around their, their interests. So it can definitely help with rapport building. Um, you know, sometimes CBT is hard work. It's really hard to face our tears, for example, or um, to fight depression. And so potentially using this as sort of a, a reward or, or a break. I know when I'm working with some um, kids on the spectrum, 
um, after doing an anxiety exposure, you know, we'll pull up a YouTube video of whatever they're really interested in and I can learn about their interests that way. I've also worked with um, some families in the past where I think they had the idea that they could just drop their kid off um, for a therapy session. And um, I was gonna work, work some CBT magic and then the anxiety or depression was, was gonna be gone. Um, and, and I like to be really concrete and explicit up front that uh, effective treatment is likely going to need some involvement from the family members. It's much more likely to be team-based. Um, this promotes generalization of skills um, and really it can be um, bi-directional learning. So I can learn from the family members um, and they can also learn what we're, what we're doing in treatment. Accommodation of sensory sensitivities. I really um, appreciated hearing um, from some of the presenters earlier today about some of their um, sensory needs. I think this is something that we should be asking you know, as part of an intake to any, any sort of medical or, or men mental health setting, both hypersensitivity and hyposensitivity, right? Um, so I know that um, I've gotten feedback before about smells in an office um, or the lights are too bright um, or you know, the street noise is too distracting. And so knowing that up front and modifying the physical environment to support these, these sensory needs. And then the last one here is um, taking some time to understand the autistic individual's um, emotional vocabulary. So I've worked with um, people in the past where, um, you know, if I was checking in with how they were feeling, they could tell me if they felt good or bad, um, but didn't really have, have the words yet to, to describe that in more detail. You know, did they feel bad anxious? Did they feel bad sad? Did they feel bad angry? Um, and so digging into that a little bit more can, can be really helpful. All right, so I know there's a lot of information trying to, trying to pack it all in here. I do wanna um, just give some take home messages. So if you're sort of zoning out for those last few slides, it's okay. I know that uh, I'm right after lunch, you may, you may be a little sleepy and um, have a full stomach. So here are the take home messages. CBT is an empirically supported mental health intervention for autistic people. In most cases, it's targeting the anxiety or depression um, or other co-occurring um, psychiatric condition. It's not treating the autism. It, and, and this is such an important point that I'm sure we could talk a lot about. Um, that is not the focus at all. We're focused on those co-occurring mental health concerns that are, are really getting in the way. And that's what CBT is for. We know that improving anxiety or depression can lead to significant improvements in autistic people's quality of life. Hopefully, as you were listening to those modifications, you were thinking, this isn't a big change. It's not a 180 degree change from traditional CBT. I think that's an important point for clinicians who may be feeling a little um, nervous about doing this. Again, CBT is not a great match for all autistic individuals. That's true for non-autistic people as well. It's not, it's not going to be a great match for everyone. So keeping that in mind, I wanted to highlight a few other, few other things here. Um, this is a report from the National uh, Clearinghouse on evidence, I'm sorry, on autism evidence and practice team here at UNC. Um, they recently published this new report on evidence-based practices where they did a very thorough review of the literature um, for, for many, many years. And the report describes a set of practices that have clear evidence of positive effects um, with autistic children, adolescents, and young adults through the age of 22. So they came up with these 28 evidence-based practices for a range of outcomes, not only for, for mental health. So this included academic, um, communication, and social. Um, there are really only seven evidence-based practices identified for mental health targets. Um, we don't have time to go through all, all of these in detail, but again, this is a freely available report if you're interested um, in, in checking these out more. Um, CBT would fall under these cognitive behavioral strategies, but there are um, many others that have some support as well for mental health targets. A more recent approach that is, is gaining some evidence, I'm really excited about this one, um, would be mindfulness-based approaches. Um, mindfulness-based therapy um, or um, other mindfulness-based approaches do have some similarities with cognitive behavioral therapy. They are kind of um, built off of those, um, but there are also some key differences that I think are, are really important. Um, 
So with mindfulness-based therapy, participants really are, are working on um, paying attention, right, to the, to the present moment. So being focused, being mindful, um, be, paying attention um, to the present moment with this non-judgmental, um, open-hearted, and curious attitude as well. Those pieces are really important. So some of the mindfulness-based approaches really focus on bodily awareness. Um, they also focus on cultivating an accepting and compassionate stance toward, um, toward your own experiences, which I think is, is, is a, a really a helpful approach for, for many people. Um, so this does not have as much research support behind it yet. Um, more studies are, are happening now. There's emerging evidence for people on the spectrum. There have also been some studies showing that mindfulness-based approaches are helpful for parents of individuals on the spectrum. Um, the one thing I wanted to know, there are some concerns, um, we definitely need more research here as well, about potentially harmful effects um, of mindfulness-based approaches without other supports in place for autistic people, particularly those with a trauma history. Um, and so the idea is if someone has a significant trauma history, and they're kind of on their own, unsupported, doing some of these meditation exercises, for example. Um, they may have some triggering um, experiences and have a hard time kind of getting, getting out of that. Um, and so we definitely need to understand more about whether mindfulness-based approaches are or are not a, a good, good fit for certain people. Relatedly, there is some emerging evidence for dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT. Um, this is a newer literature really focused on um, improving emotion regulation skills broadly. So not necessarily anxiety or depression, but kind of this underlying emotion regulation. Um, the ongoing studies that I know of really range from uh, less intensive DBT um, to a full DBT program. From the less intensive side, I wanted to highlight some really exciting work um, happening with some of my colleagues here at UNC. Um, Dr. Lisa Guy and Dr. Lori Richel, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with them looking at just the skills training piece of DBT. So again, the less intensive part, the skills groups where autistic adults come and they meet together and they're learning about DBT skills. So they're not engaging in individual therapy for DBT. Um, there's not an on-call DBT clinician as there would be in a full model, but really just looking at those DBT skills. Um, and that, that's been really interesting to look at so far. I also um, wanna, wanna give a big shout out to the Autistic Adults and Other Stakeholders Engaged Together or ASSET group. Um, I know you all heard from Dr. Stephen Shore earlier today. Um, he co-leads ASSET along with Dr. Teal Benavides. Um, and it has been such an honor to, to collaborate with them on, on a couple of projects in the last couple of years. And one thing that I've learned from ASSET and both of these papers here um, highlighted are from ASSET. Um, based on their PCORI Engagement Award. And I've been learning more and more from them about um, the, the need and the desire to learn more about self-managed self approaches to improving mental health for autistic people. Um, so autistic self-advocates have recently um, identified through this work that community available approaches for self-management of mental health are a top research priority and we really need to be doing more work in this space. Um, so if you're not familiar with self-managed approaches, I have just this one slide here about it. Um, self-management really means that um, individuals are, are learning or getting the knowledge and the skills to successfully manage their mental health um, and, and those mental health outcomes um, in the community. So they're community available. You usually are not going to um, a therapist for this. They're generally low cost or free. Sometimes they are supported by someone in the role of a case manager, case manager or perhaps a peer. I've listed a few, few examples up here, um, something like exercise, physical activity, animal assisted therapy, um, yoga, meditation, this could be an app. But we definitely need more research on um, self-managed approaches for autistic individuals. Um, there, there's been very little research on this. So. Hopefully I'm putting a plug for um, any researchers out there who want to, want to study this more in the future. All right, I am keeping an eye on the time. I think I'm good to keep going for a few more minutes here. Um, I wanted to share these recommendations briefly with you all um, before ending with some resources. Um, 
some of you listening have probably heard these recommendations before because I think they're just so important and I try to work them into um, many of the presentations that I am invited to give because I really want to amplify these recommendations. Um, these, these come um, from a study um, that I led in Philadelphia where we interviewed autistic adults about what they would want mental health clinicians to know um, in working with autistic adults. Um, and we did this because we know that um, many autistic adults have had negative mental health experiences and also that many mental health clinicians don't feel equipped to, to work with, with this group. So the, um, the result of interviewing um, 22 autistic adults um, was seven main recommendations emerged. So I'm gonna go through those now and just share an example quotation for each one. So the first recommendation, again, these are four clinicians, but I think they, they apply broadly. And you're also gonna see some overlap between these and the CBT modifications. The first is to use clear and direct language. This participant said, one of my favorite sayings is say what you mean and mean what you say, especially with working with people on the spectrum because we're not gonna get the nuances. So if you don't say it, I didn't hear it. The second is to individualize treatment, take an individualized approach um, because everyone on the spectrum is different. Um, know who you're talking to. Know that a lot of people with autism are very smart and a lot of them have great skills and a lot of them have great potential and just figure out how can you specifically tailor to this specific person's needs and interests? How can you make it relatable and memorable? What's relatable to him may not be relatable to her and vice versa. Use practical present focused approaches. This was a big one as well. Um, so this person said, I want you to talk to me about how I can get a job, how to talk to people, those social skills. People said they don't wanna just sit there and have kind of theoretical discussions. They wanna be more present focused. Provide structure and predictability. We also interviewed some family members. So this is a quotation from um, a mother of an autistic adult. And she talked about how he would really like to have the same time, the day and time each week for his session. He wants to know that this is what the hour is going to look like. We've talked about this one already as well, consider, consider sensory issues. I love this idea from one of the autistic adults that we interviewed wanting to run a group of therapists through kind of a simulation of being bombarded by sensations that they cannot uh, filter out. Um, just imagine the stress and really running them through that simulation so they could experience that for themselves. This is the one I alluded to earlier that I continue um, to, to, to work on myself. Be comfortable with silence and slow pacing. It seems like for neurotypical people, silence is really uncomfortable and space is really uncomfortable. It's something that people with autism need more of. So just allowing that, whatever it's for, because you need to process the sensory information or you need to process the messages that you're getting. Yeah, take it slow, take it slow. And then the final key recommendation is to focus on treating the co-occurring conditions. So um, this participant said, my therapist is really principally just trying to treat the depression and the anxiety. He's trying to treat what he can because autism, you can't really treat it. So again, remembering that we're talking about these impairing mental health concerns like depression and anxiety and how can we, how can we reduce those so that um, all autistic people um, can, can feel like they're not hindered by, by those things. You know, I've got less than five minutes left, which I think will work out well here. I just wanted to share a few resources um, with you all before answering some questions. Um, these are all related to improving mental health for autistic people. I am very, very excited um, to share this new resource um, with you all. Um, Lisa Morgan and I co-chair the Autism and Suicide Committee of the American Association of Suicidology. I have learned so much from, from Lisa over the years. And one thing she's been advocating for, for a while, was to have an autism specific webpage as part of the American Association of Suicidology's website. Um, they have specific pages for other subgroups that are at an increased risk of suicide, um, but they didn't have one for autism for, for a long, long time. Um, and thanks to, to Lisa's adv advocating um, and, and thanks to the work of our committee, we now have our own page here that is 
um, has a lot of autism resources. Um, so I will just point you to that. Um, Lisa also has a website with crisis supports. Um, so I've included um, those links here. Um, and Lisa is pictured here as well. Um, one of the toolkits that you may be most interested in is specifically focused on um, how to support autistic people when they are in crisis. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these recommendations in depth right now for the sake of time, but these are all in, in this freely available um, resource. Um, and we've talked about many of these already, things like asking clear and direct questions, avoiding using um, metaphors or other non-concrete language, allowing extra time to process thoughts, helping shift the thoughts to, to something more positive, really explaining uh, the rationale behind your recommendation. So why is this coping strategy recommended? Why might it be helpful? Um, and then if, if, um, if people are interested in learning more about um, facilitating a safety plan, I'm happy to talk more about that as well. A few more free resources for you all, so you'll have, have all of these available to look into more later. Um, Autistica in the UK has this one on their website. Some wonderful um, collaborators in uh, Canada have created this mental health literacy guide for autism. So this was created by doctors Jonathan Weiss and Yona Lunsky and their team, um, which included autistic individuals and family members as well. And I don't know about you all, but I feel like with COVID and a lot of the supports that have come out around how to um, help autistic people navigate COVID, some of those recommendations definitely apply to other areas of stress and uncertainty as well. Um, so there's this resource um, from, from UNC, from the Frank Porter Graham Institute. Um, and then I just wanted to share some of my favorite um, resources for adapted or, or modified therapeutic approaches for individuals on the spectrum. Um, so all of, all of these books are ones that I turn to frequently. And then my last slide, I know Dr. Soule mentioned this at the very beginning, this is a good way to wrap up, just thanking um, the wonderful hub team that I have the, the privilege of working with um, here for the Echo Autism uh, Mental Health Program. So we're on our second cohort now. We are really focused on increasing access to CBT for autistic people who have co-occurring anxiety and depression. And um, I know Dr. Rachel Brown is gonna be leading this next part. There's her picture up there. Love getting to work with, with Rachel and Melinda and Ellie on, on this team. And we're, we're all just kind of bringing, bringing this awareness and this passion around improving mental health services for people on the spectrum. So thank, thank you all so much. And I look forward to answering any questions.